folks, DSO here with another episode of the Dad Starting Over podcast. And with me today is Jude, the Divorced Dadvocate from DivorcedDadvocate.com, as well as the Divorced Dadvocate podcast. Jude, welcome. Hey, DSO. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, my pleasure. So tell us, what the hell is Divorced Dadvocate all about? What do you do exactly? All right. Well, the Divorced Dadvocate grew out of me having my own absolute case study in the most crazy, screwed up, difficult, challenging divorce. And so after about, so I've been divorced now about a little over nine years. So about uh, after about seven and a half years and in and out of court and, and I can't even tell you the amount of money, I looked at it as, wow, this has really been an investment in my education around divorce. And so what, you know, I'm spending all of this money and I continue to spend all of this money, unfortunately, but, um, well, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, and what can I do with this? And so I had been already working and coaching men in masculine development. And, uh, and, and I said, well, I think it would be really a good idea to niche this into helping men during and after divorce. So I created the Divorced Dad Advocate. It's kind of a play on words, right? Dad Advocate and niched it down to specifically dads going through divorce because I'm a father of three daughters. And so it's a little bit different when you're going through divorce with children as it is, as opposed to if you're just kind of breaking up. Hey, sorry, that was, you know, good try and I'll see you later. That never happens when you have a co-parent and, a, and and children. And so I decided to create the Divorce Dadvocate community. And it's more than just me, the Divorce Dadvocate and, and coaching. We've created a community where men can come to group meetings. They can, uh, they can get education. They can get support. Uh, they can do classes. They can do workshops uh, as well. So we're, what we're, what we're, creating is, is something a little bit uh, a little bit bigger a little bit grander we're trying the, the goal is to get men across the world and I've just been amazed because the the outreach and the outpouring has been global once we started the podcast it's in 60 some countries now has been listened to or downloaded in 60 some countries in over 1600 different cities and so weekly I have conversations with men from the Philippines or France or Great Britain or just all over the place. And it's uh, so it's a global thing that, that men are going through and specifically dads are, are going through in uh, in going through divorce. So that's uh, that's what led me in into this. And so every day is uh, is is a learning experience and I'm able to utilize all of, uh, all of what uh, I've, I, I have gone through and continue to go through and in, in helping uh, other men navigate those waters as well. Excellent. Excellent. And we were talking before this, we said, uh, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of, oh, uh, guys that we can help. And it just grows on a daily basis. And it's sad. It's it's good for us because we have somebody to help. It's not like this is such a limited population that what the hell are we going to No, there's no shortage of stuff to do and guys to talk to when it comes to this. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, yeah. it's 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 somewhat saddening that it, it divorce has become normalized. Right. But on the flip side, and, and I try to reframe it in the sense that it's a really great opportunity for men to look within when they're when a when a marriage is failing and i find a lot of men and this was this was my case too although i you know for me i'm a little bit slower so it took me a little a little bit a little bit more time to to come to doing the self-reflection and trying to understand what's going on and why things didn't work out because we all bring something to the table and it takes two for something to work well but it also takes two for something to not work well uh also so it is a, it is a good opportunity unfortunately it's it's normalized i would i would prefer and we in, in in my work it's always the best if you can try to save a marriage and i know that you talk about things in, in your books of ways in which to do that and and strategies on doing that that is always the best thing because you do not want to go to, through divorce. Nobody wants to go through divorce. And especially if you have kids, 
you don't want to go through divorce. It is traumatic, and that's why my my tagline is making it less traumatic. It's going to be traumatic for everybody. And if you can avoid it, if you can work through those, whatever it may be to, to avoid it, that's absolutely the best thing. But if not, then there's guys like me here to help you through the process <laughs> and try to sort things out and, and get your life uh, uh, in a position to have an even better one after uh, after divorce. Very, and you just touched on something really big there about um, for a lot of men, the trauma that they go through with this divorce um, it gives them a reason to have a very like a big time out in life and become way more introspective and way more. What am I doing here? What's my role in this world? What are my goals? What, and it, it's sad that when we get caught up in the, what I call the machine of a relationship, kids yeah. job, but we just completely just back burner, put it aside. Right. And, uh, when all of a sudden life says, Oh yeah, watch this. We go, Oh shit. And, I guess I better kind of start looking at those things. Wouldn't it be ideal if as men, we could initiate that same mindset while within a relationship? Wow. There's, there's a thought. Um, but most of us don't, it's so simple just to get caught up in the machine and get lost. I know I did. Yeah. Well, so did I. um, Yeah. So did I, everything in life takes effort, right? DSO. So your relationships, your, your work, your parenting, whatever it is, takes effort. So, if, and, or, or your self care, your access, it seems as exercise, right? If you take a week or two weeks or, or a year off the gym, things are going to deteriorate in your body. So it's the same as in anything else in, in life. You got to just stay, uh, you know, stay out with it and where you focus your energy, things will, things will happen. Things will expand. So you're absolutely yeah. correct. And a lot of men see, um, you know, post, especially when you've been in a toxic relationship, a sexless marriage, et cetera, they, they see a divorce as this, yay, almost like recess time. I get to be me again and party and live up the single life. And there is an element of that in it. But I think if you play your cards right, you realize this is really hard work time. Yeah. And uh, I've been neglecting a lot of hard work during these years of being married. It is, as ironic as that sounds, because marriage is hard work. Relationships are work. Yeah, well, try being a single dude. Exactly. And try and navigate the waters and everything, which is a good segue into what you and I are going to talk about today, which is the always fun topic of dating <laughs> after divorce. Right. Oh, boy. Oh, boy uh, is right. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me start and you tell me if this was your uh, uh, experience. I started way too soon in hindsight. Now, put myself in that brain that I had then. Oh, no, I'm going to have fun. Um, I have just been wronged in this marriage. Um, I suddenly feel more alive than ever in one way, but I'm also traumatized. And if I'm being honest, I'm a little nutty. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, not firing on all cylinders. And what better way to make me feel better than let's go out and get some attention from some women. Oh, it's great. And yeah, that always works, doesn't it? <laughs> right. um, what better human band-aid than a woman? Right. And that fills that void. Yep. And I look back and go, oh, geez. In fact, I, um, I'm very open about the fact that my now wife, I met way too soon. Hmm. And we both acknowledge that we've met way too soon. And ironically, we both, our marriages ended pretty much the exact same time. We both started dating at the exact same time. And in hindsight, after the fact, we're like, we maybe should have waited like a year and a half more, maybe a year, year and a half more before we decided to start dating again, because there was all kinds of little drama and emotional moments in that first year, year and a half of us dating. And obviously after eight years, that's subsided. And we look back and go, what were we thinking? Well, we were hurting. Yeah, right. And we just wanted to, to fill that void. Can you uh, attest to the same? Absolutely. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't just start dating. Like before, before I figured it out, I had like gone through multiple relationships until I had to say, huh, there seems to be one common denominator here. <laughs> that would be me. And mm-hmm. so, and, and, and so, you, you know, you hit it on, on the head in, in, when you said about, um, about waiting and I have a, an immense amount of respect for, for the men that, that will stop and go through this, this process and say, okay, well, what, it, you know, I want to analyze this. I want to, I want to see, I don't want to just, just keep perpetuating those, uh, maladaptive behaviors, if you will, that, 
uh, continue on because they're not going to stop when you get a divorce. So when you said like, oh, you know, I'm going to get a divorce. It's going to be great. And the grass is going to be greener on the other side. It's actually not if you're not going to take the time to do the self-reflection. And, 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 and that is that's also reflected in this, uh, the second marriage divorce rates are even higher than, than first marriage divorce rates. The first are over 50 and then the second marriages are over 70 percent. Uh, and so that's just that just shows if you haven't stopped to take the time to, to do the work and understand why you're just going to continue those behaviors. And, and, and guess what? You're going to find exactly the same women <laughs> or woman that you had before in your marriage and you're going to perpetuate that same dynamic and again i'll go back to my experience which was i i was a little bit different i wanted to have the family i just missed the family i just was trying to plug somebody else back into it and guess what i just kept plugging in the same person each time going wow why do i keep attracting this like what is wrong this world is terrible there's no good women out there da 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 until mm -hmm. I stopped and said, oh, what are these these uh, behaviors that I'm bringing to the relationship? Uh, what is this codependent behavior, which was my big one in, uh, in, in attracting these, these women? And uh, then things started to, to start at the ship slowly. But again, I'm a really slow learner. So uh, there's a lot of men that I work with that are like on it and working hard through it and, and figure it out. And that's a much healthier way also to do it for your children because they see you going through a difficult and challenging time and they see that you're trying to understand it instead of just perpetuating the same thing and being blind to it. So the dating opportunity actually in, uh, in dating after divorce, particularly if you have children, I've found to be a fantastic opportunity to share with my daughters about what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong the relationship, why it's going well, why we're breaking up, uh, et cetera, and give them really some insight into something that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do if I was married, right? So if you if you look at it from that perspective, I, there's no better way for me to convey to my daughters the right and the wrong ways to, to be dating than dating than being out there dating. So, and, and then share, then being transparent and sharing with them about, about what's happening. So I've tried to look at it from, from that standpoint, while it is, although very incredibly challenging <laughs> to date. Mm -hmm. And how old are your daughters? My daughters are 15, 13 and 11. Oh, wow. So they're so just they're in those prime years of discovering boys and exactly. what all that means. And boys, so they get a front row seat of boys, watching boys, a single man in action. Boys, 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 boys. boys. <laughs> yes. You know, you, you touched on a phenomenon that a lot of guys that I talk to realize, which is, holy crap, I just started dating my wife all over again. <laughs> yeah. Not literally, but <laughs> my wife is Karen. This is Sally. Karen and Sally are exactly the same in a lot of ways. Um, you know, a lot of men, the knee jerk reaction after two or three bad experiences is, well, all women are just terrible. Yeah. Or more specifically, all women these days are fill in the blank with some bad word there um when the reality is from when you sit and talk to these men and well tell me your experience you say well dude um you have a track record for ignoring a whole lot of red flags and you uh, in addition to that you're putting out an energy that says hey world i'm broken mm -hmm. right. and who are you going to attract the not so, or the you know, not so um the women that don't have their heads screwed on straight yeah and um because the women that are well grounded will meet a quote broken man, and after about five minutes, will get wide eyed and say, "Hey, it was a pleasure meeting you," and back up slowly and go the other way. <laughs> right. um, the ones that uh, aren't so grounded say, "Oh, look, here's a compadre in brokenness. Yeah. Hallelujah, we really click. This is awesome." Um, and a lot of men tell me, "No, you don't understand. I didn't see any red flags. I put this one through the ringer." Well, tell me more. Well. I wasn't even divorced yet. Uh, my wife left me, and about a month later, I met her. And right away, we moved in together, and I met her kids. She met my kids. I'm like, well, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> right away, there's red flag number one, because that woman should have said, oh, you're not divorced yet? Right. Get back in touch with me later when you are. Right. So there's a red flag. She was just like, let's do this. Another red flag. She's ready to intertwine your lives so quickly, and yeah. you are. 
yeah. this is not good. Right. Yeah, well, and most of the men eventually come to the realization that maybe I should let the women rest for a little bit. Yeah. And my standard line is, yeah, they're not going anywhere. Just calm down. It's not oh. like you have a biological clock and you must, ro- you know, procreate before you die type of thing. Most men have already done that and got the vasectomy. Yep. So, so what's your hurry? And they'll say, I just don't want to be alone. A exactly. lot of men are scared to death of being alone. Right. And that is not good. And it's not healthy. Right. Um, it's filling a void, think? like you said. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. I guess um, in the environment that I grew up in, my dad very much valued his alone time. And I, growing up, very much value mine as well. It is just known that dad, husband, needs his guy time, go away time. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Sure. And sometimes, you know, my wife and we're not together and she'll say, well, what are your plans today? And I say, eh, whatever the hell I feel like. I don't know. Exactly. That's just. Right. And it's like, cool. Have at it. Um, I, I don't know what the mechanism there is and why we have such a strongly, I guess, codependent is the term, uh, population of men out there today. And what's going on? And obviously it hurts them a great deal down the road when it comes to their interpersonal relationships. Um, One thing I've pointed at in my talks is uh, lack of father figures in their life. That's very common, Um, surprisingly common from what I've seen. Uh, Because a lot of my talks are the men will 20 minutes of listen how horrible my situation is. And I'll sometimes have to say, let me stop you there, please. Let's just rewind the hands of time. Can you tell me about mom and dad? Exactly. And then I hear horror stories. Right. And a lot of those horror stories involve what dad? Dad took off when I was four. Stepdad came to the picture shortly thereafter and beat me, whatever it may be. So maybe that's a, um, as a dude, maybe that's a knee jerk way of saying, hey, men, step up. It's all our problem. I don't think that's all of it, but I think that's a big component of it. Have you seen much the same? Yeah. So what you're describing is, is exactly it. And I, I, I teach a divorce class for, for dads calling dad's divorce blueprint. And one of the first things that we talk about are what I mentioned earlier, these adaptive behaviors that we learn in our childhood. And that is maybe, um, maybe mom was narcissistic and overbearing and you learn to please mom all the time. So then you take that and which actually be, you know, adaptive behaviors are remarkable because as humans, we have just an amazing uh, capacity to adapt to any situation. We've done it over the, the millennia to be able to survive. And we do the same thing in our childhoods, or maybe you had an alcoholic parent that's, uh, that, that would come home raging or, or whatever it is. You are, or a parent that was uh, absent or would just take off and you had to care for yourself. We as children learn to adapt to whatever it is, and it helps us survive our childhoods. And even in the most um, loving and good environment where parents are conscientious, there's things that that needs that don't get met. So you adapt to to be able to get those needs met. And then you bring it into your adult adult relationships and your adult life, and then those don't necessarily serve you anymore. Mm -hmm. Making a woman happy all of the time like I did, you know, like I did with my mom and I'm speaking from experience there. So that was my thing, which was what made me codependent does not serve your marriage well. And so, you know, and, and so, and it, and it just depends. It depends on the man, depends on the situation, but you hit the nail on the head with start looking back maybe to your childhood. And if you have the, the means to sit down with a coach or a therapist, which is something that I wish that I had done a lot earlier because it just, would have cut the time frame of, but again, I'm a slow learner, cut the time frame of, oh yeah, this makes sense because they can point out to you, well, have you thought about this? Or why don't you journal on this? Or, or here's an exercise for you uh, to do that. So absolutely. And, and, and then the other point that you touched on, which is our society is, I call it the Disneyfication of, uh, of the world, right? So it's all, Disney and we're going to find the one and the one's going to be the the best friend and the lover and their colleague and like everything to every it's just impossible you just can't get that from one person and it's insane you like Mm -hmm. this whole soulmate mentality and Mm -hmm. it's it's not marriage is is a lot different and and I would I guess if there's any advice I don't I'm not really into giving advice but if there's any advice that I would put out there is like reevaluate and reassess 
what it is that you feel is a, a relationship between a man and a woman and, and, and what you want that to be. And that can be different for different people, but really take that time to really understand what uh, what you want that to be in, in marriage. If you want to get if you want to get married, if you're looking to get married uh, or get remarried, really do that self-reflection around what your values are, who you are, number one. Uh, and then what it is that you want in, in a marriage and going forward, because that might be different than somebody else's uh, idea of what that is. And be clear and transparent then uh, about yeah. that. And uh, you, you hit on several really good points there. One to touch on more is the the Disneyfication. Um, not only does that, I think, pertain to I'm going to find the one that checks all the boxes for every emotional need that I have as a human being, but also that this marriage and relationship should also be uh, relatively drama free from now until the end of time. <laughs> um, and there should be no difficulties. And I, it really surprises me how many men have relatively minor hiccups within their marriage, really any relationship, work, friendship, marriage. And, uh, oh my God, I must stomp out this awfulness immediately. What do I do? I can't, how in a common term or, or common question I often get is how am I supposed to deal with this? Right. It's like, and uh, I, you ask these men, have you ever encountered any kind of major life drama in the past? Well, death of a family member or something like that, but nothing, like, I don't know. This has the, the drama within a relationship um, is like a special flavor of awfulness to a lot of men that they are just not equipped to handle and they don't know how. And I think that probably also goes back to lack of a strong paternal stoic figure in their life. Sure. Um, and you touched on another thing with the toxic uh, narcissistic mother, overbearing mother. Narcissistic may be too strong of a term. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, that's a term that's being thrown around a lot lately, online and yeah. so forth. I yeah. married a, a narc. I married a narcissist. Right. And it's um, narcissistic personality disorder is a thing, but I don't think it's nearly as common as people think. We all have narcissistic tendencies. Absolutely. But full-blown yep. narcissist is something else entirely. But anyway... Um, I've spoken to a lot of men who, after listening to their story, I'm like, yeah, mom may have in fact been a, had narcissistic personality disorder, borderline or whatever. Um, but that special flavor of awfulness seems to be absent father figure. Um, he left and mom looked to me to fill the void. Mm -hmm. And I was my mom's emotional caretaker, or as I like to call it, a surrogate spouse okay. to her. And I was her little man. Mm -hmm. And I got to hear about all the boyfriends and I got to hear about everything. And I got to hear about work and I had to soothe her and I had to make sure I didn't walk on eggshells because mom was a real tyrant if she was pissed off. And I also, and this is always the icing on the cake. And I got to hear about how awful my dad was. Yeah. Don't you dare be like your father. Right. Well, geez, can you imagine just ingesting all that as a child? Obviously that's going to have detrimental effects on your relationships going forward. If you don't, going to another one of your point, go talk to somebody about it. Right. And what we're talking about, and we're, we're not in our heads because we hear it every single day. This is not unusual. This is not something you're going to go to a therapist with and they're going to say, whoa, you blew me away. I've never heard this before. Yeah. No, they're going to look at you and go, yeah, you're number six of the day. <laughs> yeah, all right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club, dude. <laughs> and yeah. good news is that um, we know somewhat how to address this and how to address your your anxieties and, and your... your um, your inadequacies in relationships, and we can really point to why you keep going down the same path again and again. Mm -hmm. Because guys, listen, if you don't take that step, that hard work, that introspection, you're going to do it again and again and again. You're going to yep. meet your wife all over again. And yes, you're going to meet one that's going to be like, no, dude, I'm telling you, it's been two years and everything's wonderful. Yeah, right. And then year three hits and you're like, oh shit, here we go again. Yeah. I've heard that so many times. Sometimes it doesn't come till after the the kids show up in the picture after some major life event, somebody loses a job, gets sick or something like that. It's usually some big giant, holy shit thing that kind of uncovers uh, the inner workings of a person and how they cope with things. Um, which going, let's take the conversation to a next, next direction, which is I've met somebody wonderful. Well, can I Do make a quick, have a, can I make a quick comment on what you said about, um, yes, please this, about, a, you know, going to a therapist and you thinking that this is, you know, you're the only one, that was an aha moment for me was when I finally got into a 12 step codependence, uh, codependence group and sitting there and listening to
to everybody else say out loud what was going on in my head. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one. So for me, that was a relief. I was going, oh, this is great. I know, I know, I now know what it is. And there's actually a way in which I can go forward and heal from this and, and figure this out so that I can have a healthier life. Because the the other thing I wanted to comment on also that we that you said is we can just numb. Our, our society is set up to numb from the moment we wake up to the time we go to bed. So we can numb, we can ignore. And if it's feeling uncomfortable to you, it probably is something you need to address. So whether whether that's a life altering, so hopefully it doesn't get to a life altering uh, uh, or a life changing situation like a divorce or something uh, bigger or an accident, but even pay attention to these small discomforts, these uncomfortable feelings that you might be having because they're pointing something out to you that you need to be paying attention to. And if you don't pay attention to to them, then they're going to manifest somewhere in your life somehow. It's going to it's going to come up in sickness. It's going to come up in accidents. And, and if you still not paying attention, it's going to come up with something bigger. So pay attention to that stuff and, and go and get the help. And it's going to be a relief because you can start that that process of healing. So that was a that was that was a great that was a great, great point. Because we're isolated as men so often and yep. we're siloed and we're not, you know, we don't have that father figure like you said, uh, that you can go to and you can talk to and say, Hey, you know, what I'm I'm feeling this or this is what's going on, you know, and, and talk about it. That's one of the reasons our men's groups and I know your men's groups uh, are packed with men that just want to connect and talk about what's going on. And I think we need more and more and more of that because the unfortunate, you know, the unfortunate side effect of normalizing divorce is now that we've also uh, normalized single parenthood. And mm. I, I'll just say it out loud, DSO, we're not meant to parent by ourselves. It's just not the way that it's supposed to be done. And it's never, it yeah. has never been, and I've always, I've, I've always been cognizant of this in, in, in my life, but it's never been more obvious to me than with teenage daughters, because no matter how hard I try and how, and, and like, I'm on this, right? I'm paying attention to it. I'm trying to pay attention to the feelings. I read books. I try to talk about this. We create, it just, I cannot provide the female feminine energy that they mm -hmm. need in their lives because I'm a man, I'm a dude, I'm the dad. And that's fine. But, you know, you talk about the flip side with the single motherhood. We've, we've not only just normalized this, we've like glorified it. Like, oh, this is great. And you're doing, you know, it's great. And it's not a slam on any single dads or single moms because we're all doing our best and working really hard in a situation that is probably the most challenging. But what happens then is things are going to fall, like things are going to fall by the wayside. Like you're not going to get the, you're not going to get the, the boys that have a, a well-developed masculine nature and understand their masculine energy and are comfortable with anger and then how to manage their anger or comfortable with achievements or, um, uh, or, or, you know, being a leader because they've never seen that or they've been mm -hmm. like you described told uh uh told that don't be like your dad or like i was told you know you're just like all men whatever that meant right but it was a derogatory thing and and so you're just not going to get that that flip side and again that's why it's so important with the work that you're doing the work that i'm doing the divorce the advocate community dso you know dad starting over community to get more men involved in this because then there's some of us that you know, even if I'm a slow learner, just slowly learn some mm -hmm. of this stuff and we can share with more and more men because it's not it's not happening and the divorce trend is not going to change. The single parenting trend is not going to change. So we've got to figure out an alternative to, to help men to get through this. You got it. And we're human beings and human beings by nature are social creatures. Yes. And we know that one of the forms of cruel punishment is uh, solitary confinement. Right. You have no contact with other humans. And uh, so many men kind of self-impose that on themselves. Um, I'm, I'm too busy with work. I'm too busy with kids. I, I have no time to go make friends and so forth. And they, but they still have that very real need for social interaction and to be able to bond with somebody. So what do they do? 
they go out and try to fight a woman. They, they'll make time for that. Yeah. And they put the entire weight of basically their mental health on the shoulders of these women. Yep. And voila, it does not work. It doesn't work at all. Um, when you are a much better and more well-rounded human being and you're going out and making friends and acquaintances and, you know, sharing people that you share passions with, if you're into this hobby and you go find a group that uh, you'll find that you have a much uh, lesser need for that. Well, your neediness gets dialed, dialed down quite right. a bit. And in fact, some men that I work with have found my neediness for my spouse has died down a lot. And that actually kind of concerns me. <laughs> and I say, Good welcome sign. to being a mentally healthy individual. Right. Yeah. It was, you know, some days I don't feel like having sex. Yeah. Not everyone does every single day. Usually that's right. perfectly fine. Um, the other day I told my wife that she was not being nice and she needs to cut it out. I feel bad about it. Those type of things, those type of things happen when you're a mentally healthy, well-rounded person. And for men, um, one great Avenue to get there is just interacting with other men. Yep. Yep. And Dr. And something that's Dr. Yeah. Robert Glover describes it. I love his description. And I think you're familiar with him is, uh, mm -hmm. is, is make, uh, women or the woman in your life, the icing on the cake. So he's like, build this, this cake, this, this life that is robust and, 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 uh, fulfilling for you. And, and that's not to deride women or anything. It's just to say, and then have somebody come alongside and be that icing on the cake to where then it's something that is like really great and delicious, but it's, it's fulfilling. It's like deep. It's something that you've built and then you can do that together. And so that, and, and you, what you just described, I hear all the time with men that have been divorced they're like, yeah, I used to like to do this and I used to do that and this and that. And I was the same way. I was, I was guilty of all that. Stop doing the, the athletics and the fun stuff and that I had. And, and that's part of what attracted, uh, your, your ex spouse or your spouse to you in the beginning. And then you kind of let all that stuff go and you get focused and it's easy and it's not, it's not, you know, I, it just happens. Right. But you have, if you could stay focused on keeping that, that robust life, that, that good life, and then have somebody come alongside you with it. And then even your family, when you're, when you're in your family life and dynamic, and this is the one that, that, that makes me crazy these days is like the world and the household does not revolve around the children that revolves mm -hmm. around the couple. If you're married, if you're the single dad or a single mom, it revolves around you because if that is, if you're not healthy, if the relationship is not healthy, then the rest of it is going to be a mess. And so, you know, it's keeping the right perspective in, in the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah, that, uh, my wife is, uh, from Germany and she says mm -hmm. that she thinks America is very child obsessed Yes, and that every other mother that she talks to, it's just 24, seven kids, 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 kids. And yeah. they as they as women are notorious for dropping everything, even their spouse mm -hmm. and focusing right on those kids. And that's it. And I hear a lot of guys saying that my life are my kids without them. I'm nothing. Um, I don't know what to do when they go to their moms three days a week. Uh, I'm lost without them. Their whole identity is, was wrapped around parenthood and that's it. Yep. That's all they got. Red flags. And, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> that's not good. And I, the, this, if we could encapsulate what you need to do guys into one word, I think it's mission. Yes. You need some kind of mission in life. And when you have a passion, mission, purpose, whatever you want to call it, and you focus on it, it's funny how everything just kind of takes care of itself. Exactly. You don't have to worry about pretending to be scarce. You don't have to worry because you are scarce. You're busy. Go, go, go. You have to worry about needy and always hanging all over your, your spouse because it's, you got other things to do. You're busy and you're getting your social needs met because invariably you're going to meet other people. Right. So it, for men, especially, this is so important. Just yeah. find a mission, find something that gets you going. And if you don't know what that is, well, congratulations. There's this thing called the internet and you could also walk out your door. What a novel concept and go see the world, do whatever. Right. And try out new stuff that makes you uncomfortable. But before we wrap it up, I wanted to, if you have some advice or experience in, with yourself or talking to others, I know what I say to folks, um, how soon to start dating. And once you find one that you're like, um, you know, we click, everything's going, it's been months. 
how soon before you take the next step? How, how long do you feel a courting process should be before you say you and me and nobody else, whether that's the form of marriage or just living together or whatever it may be? What do you think about all that? So I would say most definitely don't start dating until your divorce is final. It's just just cleaner, not not le even legally, but just mentally, right? You're closing a chapter, that's the end, and then you can start thinking about it. So you know, even though it's challenging to go through that time period where you might be lonely or you're trying to replace somebody or if they will, just, just stop and, and be with those feelings and, and those emotions. So I would definitely say wait until after. And I say that not having followed my advice. <laughs> and so looking back going, wow, that was just really, really stupid. And, and I tell my daughters that too. So I tell everybody that like, this was not a smart thing because they saw me go through it. Right. And I said, this was not, that was not a good idea. That was not a smart, that was not a smart move, but, but I made a mistake. Uh, the, the next thing is take, take the time and either do therapy, coaching, classes like the dad's divorce blueprint class to go through and really because this in, in this class there's a great book also uh, called rebuilding after your relationship ends uh also but take that time to really assess those adaptive behaviors that have become maladaptive behaviors and if you need to get into a 12-step group 12-step groups are great or in a in a group coaching or just group meetings take that time to really cultivate talk to other men and, and get just a, a lay and an understanding of what's going on. Because if you were married, I was married for 11 years. Dating has changed a lot. And, and no matter, so I think you said, oh, you're, yeah. so whatever time frame, even if it's five, six, seven, eight years, it, it has just changed. So to really take that time to start talking to other men and get connected with other men, start some of your hobbies first, start building that life first before you start dating and, and that doesn't mean that maybe you want to go out on dates and you can go out on dates just be cognizant and open about what you're doing like i'm just getting back into the dating i just want to go out i just want to you know have a female presence you know with me and and you're gonna you're gonna find and, and what i found is there's a lot of women on the other side that are going through much of the same stuff and in, in, albeit a different way but they're still having some of the same stuff they're still like oh i might be testing the waters or I might be, or I might not have done the work myself yet, or I don't know. So if you're transparent, transparency is a really big thing. If you're transparent about what you're doing, that's okay. But I would say until you've really done that work, and, and there's no time frame because it depends on who you are. Like when I got into the 12 steps, I did the, the whole thing in three months. Like I, like it was two hours a day and I just put it in my schedule, blocked it out. And I was like on a mission. To fix myself right which you know now i've come to realize that that's a, that's a never-ending thing right it's gonna just i'm gonna to the day i die but you know it depends on how much effort you're putting in you know, how much therapy you might be doing or groups or, or what you're doing to heal so i don't know that there's a time frame but i feel that there is a time frame once you do start dating in the process for dating and i'll and i'll give another book i love i love to read so um, I read all of these these books, and that's I, again, I'm, I'm none of this stuff. I'm, I'm I'm brilliant enough to come up with myself, but I, I read a lot and I try to convey as much of this information to as many people as possible. But uh, Sean Smith has a book, and it's called The Tactical Guide to Women, and he talks in there uh, the first half of the book about what we basically have talked about this whole time: doing the work on yourself and understanding yourself and knowing your values and beliefs. But then he talks about the second half, which is which is taking the time to date, go through that, that process of dating for a period of time, like, and he says at least a year to date until you really get to know, because somebody can fake it for a little while, or they can cover up kind of those red flags or hide those red flags for, for a period of time. But once you've been around them and you've gone through the seasons with them, that's another phrase. If you go through the seasons mm -hmm. or go through the holidays mm -hmm. with them, and, and you, you're going to kind of see really what they're about. And then you can also see what your dynamic is and if you're comfortable with that. And if you know what it is that, that you want, like we talked about in the beginning, uh, what you want from the relationship, then you're going to you're going to know if you want to take that to the next level, and to the next step of saying, well, I would like this to be a committed relationship. And, and then let's start moving in, in that direction 
after, I don't know, seven months or a year, once you know that it's somebody that you can envision yourself doing that with. And I think that's what happens. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, is like getting into that committed relationship right away because oftentimes women are like, well, I want to lock it down and I want to you know, do this as soon as possible because <laughs> if he he's, you know, starts to see all this craziness come out, then he's going to be gone. Right. Yeah. And, and that's not all. I'm just being facetious, but, um, um, you know, take that, that time and then commit to something that could potentially be long-term after maybe a year and then take that year to two to, to year two to really see if you can blend that those lives together, right? Have that, that person come in as the icing in your cake and, and, and be part of your life. If you have children, that's becomes even more of a delicate dance that you have to, to sure figure does. out yeah. as well. So especially, especially if you have children really be just slow in the process and take your time in the process. And it might be painfully difficult and you're most almost guaranteed to get a buttload of pressure from the woman on wanting to move yes. faster and just yeah. be be just just strong about not moving it faster than you feel comfortable. I am. Um, I take things a step further and I tell men, your divorce is done. Give women a rest period for about a year. Sure. And I think that's when it's the, the whole introspection and working through all your emotions and everything else, simply because what you just mentioned, uh, you're going to get pressured. You're getting, and sometimes that pressure is escalated even to the point of, I'm ready to have babies. I'm a 30 something year old woman who oh. just got divorced <laughs> yeah. and, um, my clock is ticking and you seem to be good enough. Let's go. And if you're a man who still has those codependent, you know, um, inklings, yes. uh, tendencies, and, um, you don't want to let this one go because she makes you feel better than you felt. And you don't know how long, like how many men are like, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can move in. Yeah, okay. We can start trying to have a baby. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then a year or so later, they come to me and say, what in the hell was I thinking? Yeah. Um, I say, you just started way too soon, dude. You weren't ready. And uh, mm -hmm. she smelled that a mile away. Yeah. She said, here's one I can put my hooks in. Yep. And uh, congratulations, you met your wife all over again. Yep. So ideally, give it a good year. Nobody listens to that. Everybody, you know, we need that social connection. Men are sexual creatures, most part, for the most part. And um, they have needs. Yep. And if you have a little bit of looks and charm about you, oh boy, it's easier than ever just to get on oh. your app and say, I need to meet somebody next Wednesday and boom, it's done. You're like, well, that was easy. Yep. Well, you talk, you talk about how things have changed in the dating world. Uh, I was married for 15 years, was with her for over 20. And talk about a totally different world, my goodness. Yeah, it's just alien. Yes. Like, what? This is, it's this casual and it's this, yeah. And that was actually kind of disturbing to me at first. And that was, you take my very pliable and traumatized brain and then throw it into that deep into the pool. And I was just like, holy shit, what is this? I don't like it. It's all nutty. And in other words, I wasn't ready for it at all. Right. And um, yeah, I got, I, I was roadkill on the dating highway there for a while. <laughs> yeah, was, right. It was just crazy after crazy after crazy, which, and this sounds nihilistic on my part when guys are like, uh, most of, or all women are like this. I say no, but I'm kind of going to play Mr. Asshole here and say probably most of them are. Um, not everyone is cut out for this long-term monogamous one-on-one -on -one relationship. If that's in fact, as a man, what you're after, not everybody's wired for that. Sure. And they may say they are, they may want it more than anything, but they don't have the skills, the know-how, the tools to make it work. They just don't. Yep. And that may be in the, in the form of craziness, whatever that means, um, the baggage that they bring to the table, whatever. And you discover that one after the other, after the other, and eventually you find one, that, oh, she's got the tools. Let's see if we can make this work and, um, cross your fingers that happens. But if it doesn't, that's okay. Right. And until you have that mindset, if it doesn't, that's okay. Oof, be careful. Yeah. Be really, really careful. Yeah, exactly. Get... Be because you've got to find the one that has done the work in and that's and, rare. And you have had to have done the work too. So you really need to be the person that you want on the other end yourself before you can go look for somebody that that is is what you ideally want. And then it's going to take through it's an, it's an effort, right? It's an effort sorting through yep. 
all of them, you know, and, and, and this sounds crass, but you're, you're, you're just sort, you're sorting through, right? You're sorting through just like, like anything, making a selection any other way to see if that's somebody that's going to fit. And we don't do that. I think we probably spend more time planning our vacations or buying a car than we do in our, in our there dating life sometimes. In, Isn't that funny how that in, works? It's yeah. crazy. It's really crazy. Yep. In, in, and we ignore, like, if the car was, like, wobbling and, like, shaking, we'd be, oh, yeah, there's something wrong. I'm going to take it to the mechanic. But we ignore that stuff in our, in our dating life. And when, yep. when, when we do that, we do it at our, own, at our own peril because we're fearful, right? So, yeah, you're, I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect cap to this because I have to run. I have a coaching call. Excellent. So one more time, Jude, the divorced dad advocate, divorced dad com, and look for the divorced dad advocate on uh, anywhere the podcasts are. Right. Absolutely. And uh, check them out. Yeah. Jude. Thank you so much, buddy. DSO. I appreciate it. And if I could just offer one thing out to, to your yes, audience please. that, uh, if they are uh, contemplating divorce or going through divorce, I have a divorce quiz on the website at thedivorcedadvocate.com. And it's a great tool to help them kind of assess where they're at compared to other people that have gone through divorce. So it just, it will kick out just a, a, a report that will help them assess where they're at. So everything that we just talked about in, uh, in divorce or contemplating divorce, it, it will help them through that. So it's, uh, they can go to thedivorcequiz.com or go to the Divorce oh, cool. Advocates. Uh, dot com and click on divorce quiz tab and uh, hopefully that will help some folks out perfect excellent because guys listening you are not alone there's a lot of help out there for you Amen. you just got to raise your hand and say a little help over here and guys like jude will uh they have a lot of resources to uh help you get over the hump absolutely because it ain't easy all right jude thanks a lot buddy my pleasure i appreciate it have a good one